So hopefully this will be all right. Are we, are we live or what are we doing? No, we're live. Yeah, we're just waiting for okay. you to hop on. Okay. Uh, answer what their favorite weird animal is. I was also thinking uh, yeah. weird is not like unusual, um, cool, interesting. But Every honestly, animal is weird, even if you don't know it. Yeah, true. That's why I think we were all having such a hard time Absolutely. answering it. When, when I was reading the question, like, true scientist at heart, I was like, but what classifies as weird? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, humans are pretty weird, but they're definitely not my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, a swan, that's good. Someone seems I've never heard of, to be completely honest. Not weird, unique. Not weird, unique. Yeah, that's a good one. Ostrich, that's really cool. Uh, ostrich. Hyenas are awesome. Mm -hmm. I love hyenas. Oh, yeah. I've actually, I've been trapped underneath a car while photographing a hyena. I was on the ground and that was, it was really cool because the hyena was just like walking like 10 feet in front of me looking at me and, and you could tell that it was like not, you know, just not interested in, <laughs> in going under the car to sniff me out, but like, mm. they're, they're really cool animals. I love the capybara. That's oh my god, I love capybaras. Like, they're just so wonderful. They're like hippo rodents that are really cute. Oh, <laughs> rodents. And they're so motherly. Whoa, red-lipped batfish. That's awesome. Good one. You all know you're, you're on the right call if you have, are you <laughs> bringing all of these up. Like, you're, you're in the right place. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover, a lot of exciting things to cover today. But as we continue this awesome webinar, continue to put where you're from, favorite weird animal in the chat. But also as we, you know, move along and if you have any questions for any of the panelists, which you'll learn a little bit about what they do, what they love, and um, what their favorite weird animal is, put your question in the Q&A um, and we'll, we'll answer them throughout. Um, but thank you so much for taking your time out of this awesome Wednesday to be with us. Um, I couldn't be more excited to share the conversation with these amazing six ladies on here. So let's get started. Fantastic. So if you have not been with us before, um, my face is new to you. So hi everyone, my name is Bailey Ritter. Um, I'm the youth coordinator for the Ocean Project. Um, I'm from Pontiac, Illinois originally. He, these, I, I, I was so close. Zombie snail was like a first choice, but I love my alligator snapping turtles. Um, and when I was in high school, I started a nonprofit to um, actually help raise the last endangered alligator snapping turtles here in Illinois and these are one of the babies that grew up. I look like so chill but holding one of those guys is actually quite terrifying. Um, but I couldn't be more excited um, to kind of just moderate this cool conversation um, with the Reserva, the Youth Land Trust. And I won't talk too much about them because they all can speak for themselves but the first moment I heard about Reserva I just was in awe of what they're doing to make our planet a better place, but the ways that they're going about protecting it and also ensuring that anyone, uh, no matter where you're from, can also help get, get involved in that, that greater movement to protect our planet was just so inspiring to me. And um, like I said, I won't give away too much, but um, I'm really excited to share this conversation about biodiversity because I think it's a topic that you kind of hear about in say science class in high school and then you go on with your life and, and and perhaps you don't think about it again but it's all around us and I guarantee that the very things that you love most about our planet are thanks to biodiversity and how beautiful and special it is. Um, so I did want to introduce my awesome co-moderator um, for this session, uh, Callie. Hey okay so I'm Callie Broadus, um, I'm the founder of Reserva. Uh, and just to give you a brief uh, introduction to kind of what Reserva is and what we do uh, before we dive into our lightning talks by the Reserva Youth Council members we have assembled here. Uh, Reserva is an organization that works to empower young people to make a measurable difference in the future of our last wild places um, through conservation, uh, land conservation, education, and storytelling. So uh, this, is, this is sort of 
part of that. We are led by an entire group of um, about 57 youth council members who are scattered from around the world. We have about 15 countries represented right now. And um, each of those youth council members is 26 years or older, younger. They um, share a common love of wildlife and nature, which we call biophilia, um, which is a word that Microsoft Word doesn't even recognize as a real word, but you should Google it because it's very real. Um, and they also believe in a solution-based optimism that we need to be optimistic about our chances of fighting the climate crisis, fighting the biodiversity crisis by focusing on solutions. And uh, Reserva is about um, gathering those young people together and um, working on specific solutions uh, through land conservation. So we are currently working to create the world's first entirely youth funded nature reserve. Uh, we've partnered with a group called the Rainforest Trust to do that. And we're gonna mention that a little bit later, but um, the area that we're specifically working in is Northwest Ecuador uh, in the Choco, which is west of the Amazon rainforest uh, in the Andes Mountains. So it's a really incredible place. And I will mention at the end how you can get involved and how you can help us on that particular conservation effort. But each one of these youth council members that's gonna speak today has their own background in why biodiversity is amazing why it's threatened and how we can help it. So um, I, I'm from Washington DC, just looking down at my slide here. I'm from Washington DC, that's where I am now, but what you see behind me is actually the Chaco of Ecuador. Uh, and my favorite animal, it's not weird, but it is the coyote. Uh, maybe that's a weird thing to have as your favorite animal. It's, it's North America's only endemic canid. And um, I love the coyote because it is the scrappiest, animal in America. We have hunted them beyond uh, you can even imagine. They're, we kill about 500,000 of them a year, uh, including through government funded programs to exterminate them as pests, and yet they still persist and their population is actually growing, uh, not only in spite of it, but partially because of it. So it's a fascinating, fascinating animal, plus they're just like dogs. So. Uh, should Google cool facts about coyotes and you might learn something neat. But um, without further ado, I just want to hand it down to the uh, youth council members. Are we going to have them introduce themselves first yep. or just? Just really quick and I can run through these, but yeah, introduce yourselves. You'll see who is going <laughs> by the slide. <gasps> okay. Hi everyone, my name is Selena Chen. I'm a conservationist, a biologist, and a photojournalist um, helping give a voice to wildlife in the Anthropocene, which is what I consider right now, you know, our world is being dominated by humans and everything else has to move out of the way, which is awful. Um, so that's what I do. Uh, I'm from a little bit of all over the place. I've got, you know, Indonesian, Chinese, Dutch and Canadian heritage when I grew up in Italy um, <laughs> so, and Switzerland. Um, and I could not choose a weird animal at all, also because I don't know what classifies as weird, uh, but because today is World Otter Day, I thought I would say the, the giant river otter natives to the Amazon um, because they are otters that are enormous and amazing and uh, not even a jaguar would take them on. Wow. <laughs> I, um, so that's me. I'm Shalini Vinay Salingam. Um, born and raised in Queens, New York, but my family's from Sri Lanka. And I'm invested in just what it says there, creating sustainable food systems. Um, so what that means is not just creating sustainable food systems for the environment, but also thinking about um, access to a diversity of foods um, that are nutritional um, to all people across the world. And my um, weird animal, it's the Ebex, I believe. That's how you pronounce it. And I am a huge fan of goats, but this is like goats on steroids where, you know, they have these really cool hooves that allow them to climb up dams. And you should totally check out a video. I'm sure it's somewhere on BBC, on YouTube. I'm Izzy, I'm a student. I live in London, but I'm from New York originally. And I do a lot of work campaigning for climate justice. Um, and my favorite weird animal is the mantis shrimp. 
because I a love that any animal can be that many colors at once, but I also love that any animal that's that rainbow is also as powerful and dangerous and insane as they are. Yeah. Hello, I'm Lucy. I'm 21 and I'm based in London in the UK. My favorite, one of my favorite weird animals, um, and this was a tough one, I, I put sea cucumber just because they, they're just so weird looking. And I remember the first time that I um, held a sea cucumber in an aquarium when I was younger and I was obsessed with bugs and any animal that just looked a bit odd and everyone else thought was ugly, I always had a soft spot for and it's always been that way. So I thought that was a good example to choose. Um, in terms of what I do, um, I do a lot of creative uh, digital stuff, so do a bit of writing and TV things, um, but I am mainly um, the digital content producer for the Sloth Appreciation Society, and I'm going to be talking about another of my favourite weird animals, that, which is the sloth, of course, a bit later on. Hi. Uh, I'm Sattvika Krishnan, most people call me Saf, and I'm 18 years old and I live in Coventry, which is in the UK. And um, I, I love music, I'm a diploma level pianist and a South Indian classical vocalist. And I also love uh, biology and zoology with a spe specific passion for birdsong. So later today I'll be talking about the musicality of birdsong. And my, f well, one of my favourite weird animals is the blobfish because in 2013, it was voted the most ugly animal, and I feel quite bad for it in all honesty. It does look like some of my relatives. Um, and uh, <laughs> it, unfortunately, the blobfish is actually near extinction because um, fishing companies with their trawlers, they're uh, catching it as bycatch. And when it comes up to the surface, the pressure is so much, it just turns into a gooey mess and it can't survive. I do feel quite bad for, for them, but they, they do look quite cute in my opinion. So yeah, blobfish. So if you're Googling all of these weird animals right now, stop what you're doing and just look at the slide because I decided, you know what? Let's just put all of this weird, awesome animal energy on one page, um, soak it in um, because this is some of the coolest things that are on our planet. And um, you might have heard of some, but you might not have heard of some of the others. And um, I hope that the rest of this conversation inspires you to continue looking up weird, but interesting, cool animals, um, but just also the cool, interesting, weird things uh, about our planet. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Why is biodiversity so awesome? We've been saying this word over and over and you're like, what's so cool like what's the point about biodiversity um but these awesome panelists are about to show you so yeah today i'm going to be talking about the musicality of birdsong so birdsong has inspired composers for many many years um, across different types of genres from handel to messiaen and they're considered some of the most beautiful and complex sounds in the natural world but how do birds even produce sound in the first place? Well, they have an organ called the syrinx, which is located at the bifurcation of the trachea. And it's basically an avian voice box, or the larynx. And um, along with the vocal tract and other respiratory muscles, it can affect the frequency and amplitude of ventilation, which then can cause sound. So that's how they create sound. But um, how do we relate that to musicality? Well, first of all, we have to define what musicality even is. And it's a very, very broad term, as you can imagine. So it can be basically split up into five main components. The first component is melody. So melody is um, like the tune that you can sing in the shower, the order of pictures, the succession of frequencies. So I'm going to play um, Beethoven's Pathetic Sonata, the first movement. I'm going to take it, the melody from that, and we're going to use that as an example. So this is the melody from that. So how do birds use this? Well, they use frequencies in their, when they sing, but they also use something called intervals. Intervals are basically the leaps, steps, and jumps between notes. So for example, the Eastern Peewee sings two minor thirds stacked on one another. So the first minor third is this, and the second minor third is this. 
and together it sounds like this. And that's known as the tritone, or the diabolus in musica, the devil in music. And it's got a very dark, crunchy kind of sound. On the other hand, there are more joyous intervals. For example, the common yellow throat sings a perfect fifth, which sounds like this. And it's got a very nice, wholesome kind of sound, and it's used a lot in fanfares. So if we think of the opening of Star Wars, powerful kind of sound. So that's how birds use intervals. The second building block of music is harmony. So those are the notes that go underneath the melody and the overall combination of sound. So if we go to our Beethoven example, this is what harmony and melody sound like together. So this piece is very dark and kind of powerful because in the key of C minor. So how do birds use harmony? Well, some birds are really cool because they are able to produce harmonically unrelated pitches at once, two, three, four pitches at once. They're basically able to sing chords. So, for example, the wood thrush is able to sing one rising and one falling note simultaneously. And that's something um, to do with their syrinx and it's called sound lateralization. Another way that they can use harmony is through duetting, which is a huge part of courtship process. The third building block of music is rhythm. So rhythm is like the note values in their place and time. So if we take the Beethoven example again, keep all the pitches the same, but change the rhythm, we can make it sound a bit jazzy. All I've done is just changed where each note fits in time, but it sounds a bit, sounds a lot different. Now birds are actually unable to discern overarching rhythms well. They mainly recognize tunes in terms of pitches. So if I clapped, a bird wouldn't able, be able to recognize it. But if I put that in terms of a melody, they'll, they'll be able to pick it up easier. The fourth component of music is articulation. So articulation broadly means the performance techniques implemented in a piece. So going back to our Beethoven example, if I change if I change it to make it sound legato, which means smooth, piano, which means quiet, and adagio, which means slow, it'll sound like this. It changes the whole atmosphere of the piece. So how do birds implement articulation? Well, um, the field sparrow uses an accelerando, an accelerando, which means they gradually get faster, and the huglin's robin has a diminuendo, they gradually get quieter. And tempo of songs is often dictated by um, whether they're performing it for someone or they're practicing it for themselves. And it's to do with the dopamine levels and brain activation. And the fifth and final component of music is structure. So structure is the order, repetition, and continuity in a piece. So for example, the woodchat shrike has a piece, has a song in ternary form. So I'm gonna play that in terms of Beethoven. So they have an original idea, let's call that motif A. Then they have B, which sounds a lot different to A. Then they go back to A. So that's called ABA or ternary structure. So bird song is actually passed down vertically and horizontally between societies. So that's from parent to offspring and between members of a society or group, which means individual regional dialects can arise. And it just shows you that human music and birdsong are related on a practical level and on a cultural level. So that's a whistle-stop tour of the musicality of birdsong. I don't know why you were able to do that in five minutes. I was going to say, I'm so glad this is recorded so I can re-watch and, like, memorize all of that. I was um, like, quickly, I, I thought I'd fit in as much as possible. Amazing. I now, like, just want to go outside and just, like, listen to birds. <laughs> And be like, I know what you're trying to do with your music. <laughs> sort of. Not really, though. Um, that was awesome. But we have even more awesomeness to get to. Sorry for making Saf go first, everyone else. But uh, <laughs> we will get to questions at the end. If you have questions for Saf or for anyone during these talks, please post them in the chat. And uh, while everyone else is talking, maybe we can get to answering some of them and we'll circle back at the end and try to answer your questions. Um, and just a quick note, Saf is actually gonna be doing a, an Instagram live chat 
with our friends at Connect for Climate uh, sometime in the beginning of June. So um, follow Connect for Climate and you will get to hear more about that. So Lucy. Hello, well, I don't have a piano, but I do have some cardboard, cardboard cutout sloths, if that's, it's nowhere near as good, but they're sloths. I love sloths, which I've mentioned. Um, I'm the digital content producer for the Sloth Appreciation Society. Um, I'm in London at the moment, uh, and it's 11 p.m. here, but I wanted to hop on and just tell you about how incredible these creatures are, because over the last, um, year and a half two years or so I have learned a lot about them through my work I've done a lot of research I've met a lot of experts biologists vets zoologists that have studied them um, and spent a lot of time a, a lot of time with them and I've also spent some time with them myself last summer I spent three months in Panama working and volunteering at a wildlife rescue center that specializes in the rescue rehabilitation and release of sloths and you can see that picture there um, the sloth on the right is pickle he's a tiny orphan baby sloth um, we're not sure what happened to mum but uh, this is this is a regular occurrence where sloths live so in central and south america is that babies end up orphaned uh, because their mums have fallen victim to threats posed by us humans basically things like habitat fragmentation and development things like roads and power lines um, can cause them injury and um, luckily there are organizations like the APPC the place that I uh, volunteered for that are rescuing those sloths and taking care of them um, and I got to do that which was an incredible experience but Moving on to uh, sloths, we're talking about biodiversity today and I wanted to just go over um, how diverse sloths are. I already brought this up a bit earlier on um, and when I say sloth you probably think of an animal that looks like this but not all sloths do look like this. This is just one of six species of sloth. Um, and in Lucy's video, I don't know if you can do that. I just want to make sure everyone can see Lucy's cutouts rather than the screen. There we go. Did that work? Really something. <laughs> Did that work? No. Hmm. Maybe I need to stop. I'll just stop sharing. There we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so this here is probably what you think of when I say the word sloth, but this is just one of six species that exist, and each of the six species fit into one of two groups and those groups are the three-toed sloths also known as the bradypus sloths and the two-toed sloths which are also known as the coloethus sloths and um, you might be wondering well how can I tell the difference between these two groups of sloths well one of the ways that you can tell the difference is if you take a close look close look at their noses this is a three-toed sloth and you can see it's got that sort of button nose Whereas these, the two-toed sloths, have pig-like snouts. There's also a difference in their tails. So the three-fingered sloths have short, stubby tails, but the two-fingered sloths um, don't have a visible tail. But it's not just on the surface that you can kind of tell um, the two groups of sloth apart. You can also delve deeper and you can take a look at their skeleton. Now, the two-toed sloths have fewer neck vertebrae, so fewer bones in their necks than most mammals. Um, I think the number is around five, five to six neck vertebrae, but the three-toed sloth, and that's what you can see here, is the skeleton of the three-toed sloth, has more bones in its neck, more neck vertebrae, than even a giraffe. Um, and you can see how long that neck is. What does this help them to do? What's the point in this? Well, this means that they can hook onto branches and hang upside down in the trees and graze the leaves that are all around them without having to move the rest of their body at all. And that helps them to save precious energy. And that's really important for a sloth because they have to survive on leaves that are um, very tough to digest and packed full of toxins. And if their bodies process them any faster than they do, um, the sloth could end up poisoning itself. So it has to, it's had to adapt 
to survive on a really low energy diet. So onto the species then. This, um, I'm gonna start with the two-toed sloths. This is the Hoffman's two-toed sloth and it's the most common of the six sloth species. And then the second um, species of two-toed sloth is the Linnaeus's two-toed sloth. This is the species most often kept in captivity. So if you've ever seen a sloth at a zoo, this is probably what you saw. Um, we are now gonna move on to the three-toed sloths. So we've got our um, brown-throated sloth here, which is the most widespread of them all. We also have pale-throated sloths. This is another species that looks quite similar to the brown-throated, but you can see that sort of cream yellow facial disc there. We've got possibly my favourite, the main sloth, that just looks like an angry coconut. And then we have the pygmy sloth. This is actually a picture of a brown-throated sloth because the pygmy sloth is um, a descendant of the brown-throated sloth. They can only be found on a single tiny island just off the coast of Panama. And they were once brown-throated sloths, but over time, due to a phenomenon um, known as the island rule in zoology, these sloths have shrunk. And the reason I use this picture is because um, this is about to scale. This is about the size of a fully grown pygmy sloth. This is as big as they get. So sloths, of course, are incredibly diverse in terms of species and genera, but they're also, like all animals, really important um, components of the jungle ecosystem. They live in the jungles of Central and South America, and not only do they fit into the food chain and provide a source of food for things like pumas and snakes and the harpy eagle, if you haven't seen the harpy eagle, do go um, online and look at a picture of them. They are incredible birds. I certainly wouldn't want to be caught by a harpy eagle because they are ferocious looking things. They've got talons the size of a grizzly bear's. Um, so they will just fly down and they will pluck sloths out of the tree. But as well as being a food source, sloths are also a home themselves because uh, algae actually grows in their fur and that's to do with the way that their hair is structured, there are grooves in their fur and that collects moisture and allows algae to grow. And then um, something will come along and feed on that and that something is the sloth moth. Now this is a type of moth that can only be found living in the fur of sloths. And I actually spoke to a biologist in Panama about this and he told me that um, there are actually different kinds of sloth moth for the different species of sloth. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's the uh, whistle-stop tour of the incredible diversity of, of the sloth. I mean, I need a sloth cutout now. <laughs> like, I'll send you one in the post. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, I, all of the species, I need all of them just cut out so then even if I'm not getting a a uh, sloth presentation, I can just, you know, put, pull one out and uh, inspire people with uh, the amazing facts Lucy just provided us. That was amazing, Lucy. Thank you for that Thank awesome you. tour. I have a quick check-in from, uh, from the chat. Yeah. Uh, so Cameron, I think I'll get to your question at the end, uh, but Lisa has a question for Lucy. Are all six species only found in Central and South America? Oh, oh she's been muted. Yes, I think that was a yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, they're all found um, across Central and South America, but um, different species are located in different, in different areas. The uh, main sloth, for example, can only be found just along the eastern coast of Brazil, and the pygmy sloth, as I mentioned, can only be found on the island of Escudo in Panama. Perfect. Well, I think you have some sloth converts in here as well. So um, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat and I'm going to make note of them so we can circle back at the end. But let's go on to our next panelist. Thank you for Professor Lucy, as someone said in the chat. Yes. <laughs> um, that's, uh, I mean, amazing. Um, so now that we just talked about how cool and amazing biodiversity is, um, unfortunately, as some of the panelists kind of highlighted, there are some threats uh, currently to most of the biodiversity on this planet. Um, and so we have some great next panelists talking through that. 
Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Selena. Um, I thought just I'd start off with a little spiel about biodiversity and then I'd go on to the global threats to biodiversity. Um, so now I hope that you most, most of you will know, um, we're just going to do a revisit to science class. <laughs> Biodiversity um, is the variety of all life on Earth at every single scale. So it's not just, you know, how many species we have on the planet or in a specific ecosystem, but it's also like the diversity of their genes or the diversity of different behaviors um, to the diversity of different ecosystems across the world. Like for example, there are almost 800 different e eco regions, which are different kinds of habitat that we find all over the world. Um, and biodiversity is really important because it gives us the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, the water we drink, the soil we cultivate. And quite frankly, with if biodiversity continues to decline at the rates that we're seeing right now, um, it could it could mean that humans could no longer live on this planet. So I'll start off with the threats. Uh, first of all, these are the five major threats, and I'm tr like they are quite blanket terms. So I go I'll go through each of them and kind of describe exactly what I mean by each. So first of all, we have invasive species. So invasive species are um, haven't actually been talked a lot about in the press, um, but they're basically species that are transported from their native region to from like the native region meaning where they have evolved to a different location um, so a lot of invasive species uh, spread across the world when uh, for example europeans colonized the rest of the world and they brought on their ships with them they brought rats and cats and dogs and foxes and uh, viruses for example uh, they brought viruses uh, and bacteria um, that actually were quite detrimental and wiped out um, people all over the world. Um, and at the moment, 50%, 58% of all species that have gone extinct have been linked to invasive species. Um, and invasion or invasive species is the number one cause of extinction for uh, vertebrate animals, so animals with spines um, on, on land, which is crazy and we don't really hear about it that much. Um, second of all, we have exploitation. So this could mean anything from overfishing to hunting in forests to the wildlife trade. And it basically means that we are taking too much from the environment and we're taking faster than the environment can give back. Um, and for example, overfishing is a huge issue. And um, in the wildlife trade, I'm sure we've all been hearing about because uh, since the breakout of coronavirus. And uh, did you know that up to 5 million wild birds are traded every single year in the illegal wildlife trade? Uh, so these are all birds that are being taken from the wild and used for human purposes, uh, whether it's entertainment or as pets or uh, for use in uh, traditional medicines all over the world. Uh, third of all, we have pollution. Uh, this seems fairly straightforward. But it could, again, it's a blanket term. It could be plastic pollution, so the, a huge amount of plastic that we let uh, pollute our oceans and freshwater systems. This could also mean the, the fertilizers that we use in agriculture uh, leaching into freshwater bodies like rivers and lakes. And this actually causes uh, the entire ecosystem to die, basically, because all the water, the, all the oxygen in the water is, is used up by little things like microalgae. Um, this could also be linked to uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, for example, carbon dioxide. We all know about <laughs> excess carbon dioxide being emitted into the atmosphere and causing a, rising, a rise in temperatures, but a lot of this carbon dioxide is being absorbed by the ocean. Um, and in a way, it's a form of pollution because it's causing higher concentrations of carbon dioxide in the water, causing ocean acidification and threatening biodiversity um, in the ocean. For example, coral reefs will literally dissolve um, as the ocean acidifies. Then we have habitat destruction. And this is really like one of a huge, huge issue uh, that Reserva is helping to combat. And it's one of the solutions that we've got. Um, and habitat destruction is everything, you know, from the deforestation of rainforests for agricultural production, like um, raising livestock or 
planting crops such as palm oil, uh, but it's also fragmentation through the construction of roads, or as um, who mentioned earlier about the mantis, no, uh, the blobfish, Saf said that, you know, fishing trawling, trawling trawlers go to the bottom of the ocean and they completely destroy the seafloor habitat. And that's another form of habitat destruction that we don't necessarily see, so we don't talk about as much. And then lastly, of course, we have climate change. Um, and climate change is this huge overarching issue. And there's a big, you know, climate change action, climate action movement. But we don't necessarily connect that with biodiversity and how that's causing the huge declines of biodiversity that we're seeing. Um, and they are, I mean, they are separate issues. Even if we do manage to contain uh, climate change, <laughs> which is um, um, a possibility, uh, that doesn't mean that species will just stop going extinct. Um, and so, uh, for example, I mentioned earlier that biodiversity facilitates a lot of ecosystem processes that, you know, provide oxygen and soil. 82% um, of all ecological processes will be affected by climate change. And just an example of how serious it is for biodiversity, just a two degree Celsius increase in the atmosphere um, will cause hundreds of species of birds to go extinct. So these are all very serious and it's all very sad, <laughs> negative. Um, but hopefully I can pass it on to Izzy uh, who will talk about climate change a bit, a bit more in, in more detail. All right, so thank you, Selena. Yeah, so um, again, if you have any questions about that, just add it into the chat if you're just joining. And um, I think let's move it along really quickly and go ahead, Izzy. So Selena talked a lot about climate change and it is one of the largest issues that we are ever gonna face as a species. So right now, global temperatures have increased by an average of 1.1 degrees Celsius. And this doesn't sound like a lot or something that we actually even need to be worried about at all. But the problem with these numbers when they come up in scientific reports is that they don't normally come with a lot of context. And that's one of the reasons why it's really difficult to engage people in climate activism in the first place. 1.1 degrees isn't a big deal when you check the weather in the morning, and it seems like a really tiny and significant difference. So to give some context to the impact 1.1 degrees has, the human body temperature should be 37 degrees in a healthy person. 38.1 degrees, a 1.1 degree difference is a fever, you're sick. But a 1.1 degree of warming is misleading for other reasons as well. It's an average, which means in some places it's getting a lot warmer than that. In some places the impacts aren't really being felt yet at all. And in others, it can even be getting colder. But this 1.1 degree difference is rising. Now, originally we were told by the UN that we needed to stay under one degree of global warming. That didn't happen, that ship has sailed. Now, the new target is under 1.5 degrees. And in 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, said we have 12 years to take action to avoid this. That's now 10 years. But what happens if we don't? And in some cases, even if we do? Because the effects of climate change aren't delayed for 12 years. They're irreversible after 12 years. So in many places around the world, these impacts are being felt right now, and lives are already on the line right now. Climate change is going to have a dramatic effect on everything around us. The food we eat, the places we live, the diseases we can get, that's all impacted by climate change. And it will only exacerbate existing inequalities, where the people who contribute the least to causing the crisis experience the most and worst impacts. We can go to the next slide. The climate crisis is also obviously going to impact biodiversity and wildlife. And while on this graph, climate change doesn't look like the main factor threatening wildlife populations, it's heavily linked to a lot of them. Habitat degradation, for example, is both a cause and effect of climate change. Changing temperatures can increase the range and transmission success of diseases and can increase the likelihood of invasive species being able to survive and dominate over native ones. And we are in the midst of a sixth mass extinction. There's no way around that. Last May, another UN report came out showing that one million species were at risk of extinction because of humans. And climate change is one of the main factors driving that. So what can we do in the face of a lot of this overwhelming science and facts 
The answer is a lot. First of all, there are lifestyle changes you can make to reduce your carbon footprint. If you can go vegan, for example, that's great. If you can only go vegetarian, that's also great. And if you can only give up meat one day a week or not at all, that is also great. Because some of these changes are really hard and they're not an option for everyone. And importantly, your passion or the validity of your activism is never reliant on you making those changes. Activism looks completely different for all of us and that's how it should be. Another thing that can be just as, or in many cases, more impactful is getting involved in larger movements. Groups like Fridays for Future and Youth Strike for Climate are powerful because they're political, putting the blame where it should be, not on individuals, but on governments and corporations. It also gives you a sense of community that's really, really important to have, I think. And I definitely recommend checking out what groups are near you. It'll vary depending on what country and city you are in, but there is almost always a way to get involved. Also, I can't not talk about Reserva, which is yet another way of young people coming together in the face of an overwhelming and oftentimes incredibly scary crisis. So whatever you choose to do, that is completely up to you, but please do something. It can be as simple as having one vegan meal a week or buying less fast fashion, or as complicated as creating the first youth-funded nature reserve, but we need it all. Yes, 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 yes. That was, that was so good. I know this can all feel very overwhelming in a lot of ways for many people, kind of looking at the, the threats and the things happening. Um, but like Izzy said, there are a lot of things that we can do. And with that, what, what, what can we do right now? There's a lot of ways to get involved in your backyard biodiversity, in our global biodiversity, and I am going to throw it to Shalini to talk us through that. Cool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, so, so far we've talked about the importance of biodiversity, we've gotten into the threats, we've talked about the impact of climate change, I'd like to close out the webinar by sort of talking about why I'm so passionate about conservation. So conservation done right um, is a fundamental means of promoting equity. It means protecting animals, it means protecting plants, but it also means protecting people, especially those most marginalized by society. All right, so big hefty statement, what does that mean? Well, the people that are most vulnerable, either economically or socially, they're the first to see the impacts of a failure to protect biodiversity. Next slide. Um, so we're seeing um, a rise in climate change related refugees. We're seeing the health effects of um, pollution, especially in poor neighborhoods. And we're seeing smallholder farmers across the globe suffering from climate change related um, weather disasters, droughts, floods, now locusts in East Africa and South Asia. So if we're protecting our biodiversity, the logic follows that we'd be protecting um, our most vulnerable, poor, and socially distressed communities, right? Well, that's not always the case. Next slide. Often, conservation efforts seem in conflict with the communities that are most vulnerable to climate change. All right, so why is that? Let's bring it back to the Choco um, to see why that is. All right, so the image here taken by our lovely Callie um, is part of the area that we're working to protect. So this patchiness you see here where it's not completely forest, um, that's a state of 98% of the Choco's lowland tropical forests. Um, and the question is why? Okay, so well, our site, um, there are Spanish speaking non-indigenous people, there are semi-nomadic Awa people, um, they're, tribal, um, they're, they're a tribe group within Ecuador up in the north. Um, and there are also refugees of, in Imbabura and in Karchi, and that's because of the armed conflict in Colombia. So all of these people, um, they mostly work in low skill um, occupations. So slide. Um, there are two major mining companies, oh, that's not in order. Um, so there are two major mining companies um, in the area and they're logging enterprises and palm oil plantations. And they all serve as primary, those are all primary sources of employment. And the others are farmers. So um, traditional farming in the region um, used to be small scale and it used to be about cultivating nutritious Andean pulses, grains, roots and tubers. And today while yucca and plantain are grown for local consumption. The farmers are also shifting their land, uh, their land use and they're regularly um, clearing out forests to grow a commercial crop, grown naranjilla. Um, next slide. 
um, okay, I think we're missing a few slides, but um, the Naranjia that you see here, so you see the, the little, um, they're like huge packs of Naranjia. So I've never actually had the chance to eat a Naranjia before, but I'm told it's a citrus fruit that sort of tastes like uh, a mixture of lime and rhubarb. Um, and Naranjia is sold informally in several city markets, including Tulcan, Anibara, and Ipiales, um, which is in Colombia. And these farmers can harvest about 100 to 150 fruits every 10 to 12 months, and only for about three to four years before the soil is no longer viable and they have to clear a next patch of forest um, to start the process all over again. And in the urban markets that they sell to, these fruits, they sell for 100 fruits selling for 12 to 25 US dollars. That's not a lot at all. And only two people are needed to manage five whole hectares of Nanhia. And there's no further value addition. So there's no increase in the price margin, um, you know, either with perfume or um, cookies or something else that you can make out of the Nanhia. So the shift to commercial farming and income generating jobs, they haven't just affected the ecosystem alone. They've also resulted in an unhealthy shift to diets from, in diets from nutritional um, Andean staples to whatever processed foods are obtained in the city markets. And access to those markets are frequently disrupted, especially in the area that we're focused on. So in 2019, when our team was there, um, there, were, there was a gas-related price strike and that resulted in, in access. And today, COVID-19 is a huge issue um, in terms of access to food as well. So conservation can be seen as at odds with these communities because it is in direct conflict with some of the only livelihoods that they have access to. We can't effectively and ethically protect biodiversity of a region without also considering the people settled there and their cultural and socioeconomic diet, ties to the land. Um, so Reserva and our local partner, Ecominga and Javier, who bestowed me with all this knowledge that I currently have, um, um, they're working together to reduce pressures on the Choco Forest. And in order to improve the environmental and community well-being um, that we need to accomplish, uh, there are, there are three main things that we have to accomplish. Um, so we have to develop sustainable livelihoods that can provide livable incomes. And we need to educate um, communities in the nutritional diet. And we need to increase local community commitment to protecting the region's biodiversity. But again, that can't happen unless there's a livelihood that they can rely on that it doesn't have to you know, rely on deforesting the land. So um, to help Ecominga in this endeavor, within Reserva, we've founded a committee that's focused on raising awareness of and identifying solutions for um, community well-being. And we're still working on exactly what could be an alternative uh, livelihood, um, but we're sort of leaning towards producing vanilla and developing value-added products like perfumes and such. So I want to leave you all by saying, if you're interested in protecting all the plants and animals we've discussed today and the weird animals we've discussed today, if you want to turn back time on climate change, there's so many ways you can make a difference as, you know, Izzy alluded to, but um, you can go planting trees in your neighborhood, you can reduce the plastic that you, um, waste that you consume, and you could also call on your local politicians to push for um, sustainable policies. Um, but when you're choosing to do any of those things, I also want um, people to ask the questions that I've learned to ask to get to the complexity of all of it. Um, so who relies on those lands? How do they use it? Are they in a position to help protect the land? If no, why not? And what can you do to turn that into a yes? Because the more people that can protect the land that are able to, you know, reach those Ma Maslow hierarchy goal or whatever, um, they're on your side then, right? Um, and someone once told me this, and I'll and it stuck with me for a very, very long time. And I hope it sticks with you. Listen to the voices that you can't hear as loud as the others, because that's often how you can make conservation efforts effective and equitable. Yay! I want to go through your pictures really fast. Oh, yeah. I noticed they were a little out of order, so I didn't want to. <laughs> no, you're OK. Yeah, so, that, so we're trying to look at vanilla and that's, you know, vanilla pods. <laughs> and um, can you, yeah, and this is another picture of Callie's that shows our reserve site area. And I think the peaks are where FM Minga is. Is that right, Callie? 
Yeah, so what you're seeing in the foothills there is uh, land that's been degraded for pasture um, or naranjilla production. Uh, but up on the ridges there is actually land that is under conservation, under private conservation by our partner in Ecuador, Fundación Ecominga. And um, this is really important because uh, private conservation is one of the, one of the few um, means of protecting habitat. And there were several questions in here about what can we actually do? Um, how do you actually protect habitat? Uh, there are a few different ways. Some are very complicated. For example, getting titles to, uh, titles to lands for indigenous people who tend to manage their land uh, more sustainably um, or convincing governments to protect their own land. Those, those can be kind of complicated. They can be kind of hard to tackle. Uh, but there's a third method, which is private conservation, where uh, an NGO in country can go to a family who owns land, and maybe they were thinking about turning it into pasture, and they can say, hey, you actually have an endangered species of frog on your land. Can I buy this land from you and protect it? Could I even hire you to be the guard to protect this land. And that's the kind of conservation we are engaged in through Rainforest Trust. So um, that is this land that you see off in the distance there uh, is land that's under private conservation. So it is, it is the most protected that it can be, uh, which is great news for, for that ridge line. <laughs> um, so were there additional photos here that you wanted to tab through? Yeah. Think so, no, but I did want to, do you want to share your screen, um, Callie? My, my program crashed and we're so out of time that I think we should probably go through some of the questions yeah. and uh, maybe just have a discussion. Yes, I love that. So like Kelly said, question and answer time. Feel free as we're answering um, to put those still in the chat. We'll be kind of going through those, but um, let me stop sharing so then we can see all of the lovely faces. And this is so cool. I see we have people tuning in from Hawaii, from Zimbabwe, from Nigeria. This is amazing to have such a, I see a friend from, uh, from Chile that I met at um, COP25 in Madrid. This is so cool to have such a global audience to talk about this issue that affects us all globally. Um, and one of the reasons that these people, uh, these young people are collected here is because we do care about biodiversity as a global issue um, and it matters to us that there are species that are endangered and losing their habitat in Ecuador even though none of us are actually from Ecuador. Um, many people on our youth council are but the people here um, are not. Uh, but it matters because this is our global ecological inheritance. This is what we are inheriting as a generation and the more biodiverse of a world we live in uh, the healthier it is, the more productive it is, um, and the more equitable it will be. So um, I just want to go back to a few of the questions, and um, I think that we'll, we'll answer them one at a time, but, bef but, but after we do that, I think I'll just ask everyone to uh, quickly wrap up with why do you care about pursuing uh, so this solution, at least our solution of working to, to protect habitat? Um, and why does it make you optimistic? So think about that while we go through these uh, particular questions. So um, here's a question. How can we help keep habitats from being destroyed as we are fighting against million or billion dollar organizations? That is the million dollar question. I mean, it can feel so small to, um, to be one person fighting against a corporation. Um, and as, as Izzy said, uh, activism uh, like she does with uh, the School Strike Network in the UK um, is a great way to put the onus on those corporations and to to go up against them when you um, when you gather together as groups. But what can we do personally? Um, well, I, I think that there are some really fantastic um, examples of of work by people who are fighting those organizations, such as oil companies um, in Ecuador. There's actually uh, some really fantastic lawsuits that you can read about. So sometimes it can be as small as something as, as um, simple as a lawsuit to stop a corporation. But um, for me, it comes down to uh, this, the, the simple act of conserving land one acre at a time, uh, because it is something that we can put our heads down and do without, without, being, um, without being a corporation ourselves. You know, 
Um, I have a design and architecture background. Um, you've seen here we have musicians, activists, high schoolers, people working in human welfare and global health, um, a sloth expert and a photographer. And you don't have to be, um, you don't have to be a trained conservationist or even an NGO to be able to make an impact. Um, so uh, does anyone else want to take a stab at that question? You might have to unmute yourself if so. Is this the, the corporation's question? Yeah. Yeah, I think just going off of what you said in terms of there are so many small acts such as us trying to create this land reserve. Um, but then also, as you said, in Ecuador, there are lawsuits, like civil lawsuits against, the, against these companies, people standing up for their rights and for their land. And I worked with a team in Indonesia in Sumatra where there was this you know, multi-million dollar corporation trying to build a geothermal project right in the middle of some of the most incredible rainforest in Southeast Asia. And, you know, banding together indigenous groups in the area, people in um, neighboring cities and taking it to like their local government and eventually to the federal, I guess, equivalent of a federal government in Indonesia. Um, we were able to stop this project. And also we, we took this issue to UNESCO. So it's all about, you know, making, representing people's voices. And as Shalini said, like whose voice are we not hearing loud enough? So we, you know, amplifying indigenous voices, going to lawmakers and policymakers, just like Izzy said, you know, when it comes to action, some of the some of the best action you can take is is you know, addressing politicians and, and taking it to the people who um, who have the power to to make these decisions. Um, I'm going to move on to this next question, which is maybe something that Selena will want to touch on as well. Given the wide variety of threats to biodiversity, how can we combat them? Is there one threat that's more directly threatening biodiversity than others that we should focus on? And um, I just want to say that uh, that we should focus on. That's a really important part of your question. Um, and I just I, I want to take a quick stab at, at answering this first. Um, uh, there was a second question later about basically how how this is overwhelming and, and how can we um, how can we not be so overwhelmed? Well, focusing on one issue at a time is how I personally uh, stop from being overwhelmed. So um, I once took a course about time management and it, it gave a little activity of how you write your name out. So I wrote out Cali Broadus and then you write the number of letters in your name as one, two, three, four. So you write out Cali Broadus and then you write out uh, the number of, of letters in your name in numbers. And then you time yourself doing that. And then you time yourself writing out C1, A2, L3, and so on and so forth. And see how much longer it takes you to do the same amount of, uh, the same stuff um, just by multitasking, by doing it two things at once. And it took me about twice as long to do the same amount of work just because I wasn't focusing on one thing at a time. And so that taught me that we are more effective if we focus on a single solution, or if we focus on something we know we have the best chance of doing ourselves. So uh, for me, that was starting Reserva and gathering the best naturalist minds um, to, to make this happen, um, and focusing on uh, protecting habitat through private conservation, through youth-funded pri private conservation. Um, but I was wondering if you had a, a different answer or if you could elaborate. Um, so I, there, as you said, focusing on one thing is really important, but also thinking about time scale and effect and like what change you want to affect uh, is also really important. So for example, you know, let's think about the five threats again. It's invasive species, exploitation, habitat destruction, pollution, and climate change. Well, there are two things on this list, invasive species and exploitation that we can address relatively easily. So some like invasive species or for exploitation, let's just uh, make the trade of certain types of wildlife illegal. That is one like swooping thing that you can do to stop some form of exploitation. For example, uh, you know, rhino horn, rhino poaching for their horn, just making it 
illegal in every single country where there is demand and also making it internationally illegal to tr to smuggle across borders and enforcing that that's like one i mean it's not one action but it's relatively short term and achievable um, to stop something in our lifetime um, but then there's also if you look at habitat destruction by protecting habitat you can address so many of these other issues so protecting an area of forest you're going to be reducing the number of people who are hunting in that forest uh, you're going to be reducing the um, ability for invasive species to thrive because if you have a really healthy ecosystem invasive species won't like they won't survive um, you'll also be reducing the amount of pollution because people won't be able to go into that ecosystem and pollute it. And also you'll be addressing climate change because forests and protecting land sequesters huge amounts of carbon. So it's also thinking about, you know, how can we do the most with the least amount of actions? Um, yeah. Does someone else want to take a stab at answering that? Yeah, I'd like to also think, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is I always also feel extremely overwhelmed and I don't know, I always want to figure out which is the best um, thing that I can do to make the most impact. And part of that answer lies in also what are you good at, right? So if we all come from so many different skill sets and we all come from different disciplines and different backgrounds and maybe you're really good at raising money, heck, that's amazing. We need that in our team, right? And so maybe it's not exactly tied to like understanding climate change or understanding what biodiversity means and all those different things. I'm not a zoologist. Um, but I understand that there is this need and I rely on my team members to fill in the gaps of knowledge that I don't have. But I also offer a skill set to the table, whatever that skill set may be, um, whether it's fundraising, something small like, um, or not small, but telling the stories of, um, you know, what's going on in the world and trying to use your abilities to tell stories to like amplify someone else's voice, especially indigenous communities who are constantly trying to fight these, um, you know, corporations coming into their areas and things like that, like those pieces of whatever skills you bring to the table, however you can creatively use them to do whatever part you can, if every one of us tries to tackle one aspect of it and assume to yourself that I may not be able to do everything um, in order to, you know, stop climate change and protect biodiversity, but I'm hoping that someone else has got my back and someone else has their back. And so I can focus on what I'm good at and I can have them fill in the gaps. Exactly, that, you nailed it. <laughs> so um, I know that we are running out of time and I so appreciate that we have people tuning in at literally 4 a.m. Um, where they are in the world. Um, and so I just want to uh, address uh, how you can get involved directly with us uh, because this is an action that you can take. I saw. There are a few comments in here about um, going vegan and things like that. There are tons of personal actions you can take. I'm sure you have all heard about those uh, till you are just like beaten over the head with it. So uh, do please try going vegan once a day or once a week or even one meal uh, a day. Um, do try reducing your plastic, all those things, but we don't need to go into those because uh, most of you have probably heard them um, or you can Google them. But uh, Reserva has a, a few opportunities for you to get involved directly in um, on the ground conservation in this particular area. Um, we didn't have time today to go into uh, exactly the project that we're working on um, and why this particular space is so cool. So please do go check out reservayLT.org. I think Bailey will probably have a screen that she can put up at the end so you can just write that down. Um, but uh, I'll just quickly say that if you are someone who is able to have a, have a quick fundraiser, a lemonade stand, a birthday fundraiser on your, uh, on your you know, Facebook or something, um, donating to causes like this is one way to have an impact. It only takes about $5 to purchase and protect a studio apartment sized area of rainforest about 600 square feet it's actually much bigger than my studio it's, it's um you know like a small one bedroom uh that's a ton of impact that you can make with just five dollars um so if you can donate five dollars or if you can fundraise five or fifty or five hundred you can have an, a, a massive massive impact and that's a permanent impact 
um, that you have through private conservation. Um, but if you cannot, and there are many places in the world where you can't, there are probably people tuning in here who don't have uh, access necessarily to those um, kind of fundraising resources, or perhaps you don't have good enough internet connection to make a, a debit card donation. Um, we also have an opportunity for you to get involved called the One Million Letters Campaign. This is um, an opportunity that um, is supported by National Geographic's Campaign for Nature. And basically what we're asking you to do is if you are 26 or under, if you are what we're calling youth, um, write a letter saying what you love about nature and why it matters that we protect it. Why should world governments commit to protecting at least 30% of our planet by 2030? Send us that letter, there are instructions how on our website, um, and we will match your letter with $3 toward the reserve. That's enough to protect about a classroom sized area of rainforest, about 400 square feet. Um, so you do not need to fundraise to have an impact. You do need to have a voice, um, and we would love if you would share your voice with us. We are gonna collect those letters uh, and find a way to get them to world leaders at the UN. So um, that is just a quick note about Reserva. Please do get in touch with us, reservaylt.org or ReservaYLT on social media. Um, and I promised that I would ask one more question to our panelists before we go. And I thank everyone for hanging in there. Um, so I just wanted to ask you all um, if you can give a quick, brief answer um, why you're optimistic when you work towards solutions. Um, and sorry, we can, why don't we start with Seth? Because she's yeah. the most on my screen. <laughs> yeah. So um, actually, I have a quote which I'd like to say. It's by um, uh, one of the Hindu spiritual gurus, Guru Gurudev Swami Chinmayananda. He said, until we change, the world cannot change. We must have a healthier intellectual attitude towards nature. And I think Reserva really sums up that ethos. It, it embodies that kind of concept that we, have, we can make an impact on the, uh, on the world, on the environment, and it can be a positive impact. Because on the news, it's always very negative sometimes. And it's, it, we often lose sight of what we can do. And that's why I think the solutions of, that Reserva have, donating to Reserva, the One Million Letters campaign, that it, can, it, gives you, it gives me hope. And it's very optimistic to think that we are making an impact. Even if it's a small one, any impact matters. So yeah, I thought I'll end with that. Sorry, Selena. Oh, you're muted. Hi. Um, so I was going to say that um, I, I have to be optimistic and, and there really is no other choice. <laughs> I'm a photographer. I often go to the rainforests, um, all, I go to different rainforests all over the world. I spend time with wild animals in their natural habitat as they are doing or conducting their own natural behaviors. It's the most beautiful and privileged thing to see and experience and to be immersed in. And um, every single day I think about all those wild animals out there that need our help. And this, that's exactly why I do what I do. And that's why we have to be optimistic because they need us. Shalini? Um, I think I'm the same, sort of in the same boat as Selena, where I just, I cannot, I cannot think of doing anything else other than trying with my career, with whatever it is I do to help conserve, you know, the world, to protect the world. And I think of it not only in terms of animals and plants, which is, you know, my first curiosities. I remember as a little girl going to my library and like pulling up different animals and like printing out pictures of them, just thinking like, wow, they're so cool. But as I grew up, I recognized that I really care about people. And I care about how there's so much inequity in the way, you know, people across the world live and what they have access to. And for me, conservation comes from a, a point of civil rights. Um, and so that's where I'm coming from. And I have no choice but to feel this way because I can't think of leaving this world any other way. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, Lucy. I think really it's kind of conversations like this and just when we, when, when I meet the other youth council members and I find out about all the incredible things that they're doing, you know, for a long time I just felt overwhelmed by everything and this has been mentioned. There, there are just 
you know there are so many issues that we need to deal with and they're all interlinked in really complex ways but um you know you pull together a team like this and everybody's got their own strengths and and you just do amazing things like save huge patches of rainforest in in ecuador and hopefully like plenty more so um it's been really it's really rewarding and it's really helped to spur me on and and given me a chance to actually make a difference and that's that's been very important to me izzy um yeah i think i agree with what a, a lot of what's been said already i don't really feel like i have any other option um but to be doing this and i think Reserva is a really amazing organization to be working with because of the sense of community and I found that in a lot of the organizations I've worked with, which has been amazing and building up those relationships and friendships is so important because it all does seem very overwhelming and um, very difficult to challenge and fight as an individual. So having those friendships and that sort of supportive network is really important. And I think also with Reserva, We've got like quantifiable goals. We can say we've protected this much land, we've raised this much money. And I do a lot of stuff with the climate where it's we're looking at stuff 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line. And we don't really know whether we're winning or losing. And we get all these promises from politicians and governments and we, we don't know. And so having that sort of tiny sense of certainty in a incredibly uncertain world right now is really, really, hopeful is everyone just like feeling so inspired like <laughs> so overwhelmingly inspired by all of this um i just want to thank each and every one of you who's on the panel who's in the chats um for what you're doing to help our planet um it, it the best role models for our planet are the ones who wake up every day and say I must do what I can with what I have. Um, those are the role models I look up to. Those are the role models I think that we need for our planet. Um, you all are awesome. I have a couple more things before we go, including all of their amazing contact uh, so that you all can um, chat with them after this. I see there's a really important question in the chat and everyone's okay. Please go answer this. Um, yes, so to buy, someone asked, uh, Emmy asked, how much money would it take to buy the whole rainforest? Well, the whole rainforest, thankfully we don't have to buy because so much of it is already conserved, uh, which is fantastic. Um, I don't know that we've done an analysis of how much it would take to buy the entire thing, but there have been really important analyses about which are the most important areas to protect. Not all rainforest is the same. Not all habitat contains the same number of animals. So there have been analyses that find the key biodiversity areas, the areas that have the most, the highest density of life. And that is one of the areas that we are working to protect. So the way we do it is one piece at a time, and we are working on one piece right now. To answer your question of how much, our target is $178,000. That is to protect a 244 acre piece of the Ecuadorian Choco. And we are about $50,000 of the way there, uh, entirely through youth-led efforts. Someone else asked if you can join Reserva as minors. Yes, our, our youngest youth council member is seven years old and they gave their own $3, they're from India. Um, and he gave his own $3, um, like, what is that, 300 rupees or something like that. Um, and so yeah, absolutely. Like I said, every dollar, every dollar helps. Um, and we've got a long way to go, but there are 2.5 billion young people between about seven and 24 in the world right now. So I think that we can manage $178,000. So yes, we can. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, I wanted to give a couple other next things. If you're so inspired by this conversation, you're wanting to do something like say next week or tomorrow, um, I did want to provide some additional ways to get involved. Um, if all of you don't know, World Oceans Day is coming up. Um, it's on June 8th, so that's actually nearly two weeks away. Um, but there's some really easy ways you can still get involved, even though it's quickly approaching. Um, this year's uh, theme for World Oceans Day is protect our home. And so we are um, promoting a large push um, called 30 by 30. 
30. Um, and if you don't know much about 30 by 30, it is scientists at this worldwide have determined that we need to protect at least 30% of our planet, land and water by 2030. That's at least. Um, and so what you can do right now to get involved with that, so if you've never used these QR codes, take a little picture using your phone and it will send you to the petition, the global, the global petition urging leaders to take action, the necessary action to protect our planet. We must do that. It, it's kind of the, the basic thing I, I tell everyone, that's how you can get involved in protecting our planet is just urge your, your world leaders through this petition. But also join so many more events. Um, there's awesome events that week talking about biodiversity, talking about uh, our shared ocean and climate. Um, so check them out. You can click the QR code and it'll send you to the event page for World Oceans Day. But also just share why you love our, our blue planet. Our, our planet is blue, right? And, and so World Oceans Day is a celebration of not just our ocean, but uh, our shared climate, our shared ocean, our shared land, um, and everything that makes it so beautiful is what you've seen on this um, presentation. So those are three ways. One other way is that you can see me and members of the Reserve a Youth Leadership Council at Youthathon, which is on June 6th and 7th. So that's World Oceans Day weekend. It's 24 hours, 24 hours straight of these kinds of conversations, including Reserva, where they'll talk a little bit about biodiversity, but also some other really cool, interesting stuff. So you, you won't hear a repeat of this, although I'm sure many of us would still love that. Um, but you can check us out at Rising Blue on Instagram, so r.singblue, but also register. This is perfect for any time zone, no matter where you're at, there will be change-making conversations and content literally for 24 hours. So check us out, register, it's free. It's a super simple way to, to get involved um, in a cool event coming up. But I did want to share, let's keep the conversation going. Here are these Awesome ladies contact information. Keep the conversation going. If you are super inspired, tell them, reach out to them, follow them, email them, DM them, and tell them you were super inspired because I know that that's what I will be doing after this because I'm like so crazy in awe of this conversation. But like Callie said, check out reservayalt.org. Um, check them out on social media. Continue this movement. Like I said at the beginning, Reserva to me, when I first heard about them, it, it was like an instant way to get involved. You didn't have to jump through all of these hoops. You didn't have to necessarily um, like knock down someone's door in order to get in. It's open and it's available for any of you to get involved if this is a, is a topic that you feel really passionate about. So check out their website to see how you can get involved. Um, any last words from the panelists? You all are awesome. I can't thank you enough for being a part of this great conversation. Um, any last words? Thanks so much for having all of us and, um, and to everyone who stayed for an extra half hour. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I was gonna say thanks everyone. You guys are awesome. I hope to see you at the next webinar. Um, I hope to see you just making the change that I know that you all can. Um, thanks everyone and I will see you soon. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. If anyone didn't get their question answered, please do just. Uh, oh, yeah, that's the other thing. I just realized there are a bunch of questions in the Q&A chat and not oh, even in the chat chat. So if you didn't get your question answered, please do reach out to us and um, we have plenty of time to Zoom. Yeah, for so. sure. You all are awesome. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>